What's up everyone, welcome back to another episode of Workshop Rebuild. In today's video, I'll share with you guys all the parts I mounted onto the John Deere 400 base frame, and I'll give you guys an insight on the steering mechanism, which is a power assisted steering system. And I'll also share with you guys the Cat Zero three point hitch assembly. I'll walk around the John Deere 400 garden tractor and I'll share with you guys what I mounted off camera and then I'll focus on the power assisted steering system which is on this John Deere 400. Walking up to the John Deere 400 I'll focus on the right side of the frame first. In my last video I focused on this bracket in the back which is a factory flaw. I figured this out. There was a nice gentleman on a Facebook group which told me that his bracket in the back is exactly the same. So I believe this is a factory issue. So in my last video, I fixed this bracket and I mounted everything off to the right of the frame. Uh, the washers and the cotter pins are in place. I then went ahead and adjusted the brake system. So the brake linkage goes from right there to the back. So you can adjust the yoke and that will adjust your tension as you press your brake pedals. Everything on this side is mounted. I also have these deck lifters or the mechanism that lifts the deck up and down. Um, I do not have a deck, but I just mounted those right there with those hairpins. It's easy to take off and put back on. The brakes are in place, so everything here is uh, done. The right and the left side brake are done. So when we come over to the left side, the left brake is mounted as well. And we have our spring right there, which will hold tension. Looking at the garden tractor from above, we have our two main frame rails. This is the left frame rail, and that right there is the right frame rail. Everything that's mounted externally had to be mounted on first, and then I was able to go ahead and mount my four tires. These four tires have been painted, so the rims have been painted inside and outside. These rear rims have an offset, so the welded plate on the inside is on this height right here. So what you can do with these rear tires, if you don't want the stance to be too wide, like it is right now, you can actually just flip your tires around and the wider part of the tire on the outside will be then closer to your main frame on the inside, but it will not touch any of these mechanisms right here. Um, I put it on the wider stance just to give the tractor a little bit more stability. I'll give you guys a better view on these rims. So the rims have been painted John Deere yellow and the bolts around the perimeter on the inside have been painted silver. I was thinking of painting them black first, but I thought silver would give it a nice little touch. Um, they weren't painted originally, but I thought if I paint them silver, they'd uh, stand out a little bit more. So that is the rear rim. And the front rim looks just as good. And I also painted that little center cap right there, which holds the grease in. Uh, that has also been painted yellow. If you guys want to know how I painted the rim so nicely and how I didn't get any paint on the original tires, you guys can check out my Instagram. I post some behind the scenes stuff. Uh, I also post some tips of the day. And if you guys are interested in that, you guys can also follow me on Instagram to have a better insight on what I'm working on throughout the week when I do not post any YouTube videos. Besides painting the rims on the front and the rear, I went ahead and focused on the steering mechanism. So I mounted everything from the steering gear box with the linkage down and out to our main valve. This is our main valve for our power assisted steering. This linkage then travels forward. Uh, this acts basically as our drag link right here. This will go to our front left spindle. This ties then into our spindle uh, from the left spindle to the right spindle. We have our tie rod that is this bar on the bottom. Uh, this tie rod only holds our distance from our left wheel to our right wheel. Uh, this will also allow us to adjust or pivot the wheels. Uh, this is very important if you want your wheels to look forward and not off on any angle. Uh, this can be adjusted with the tie rod. One more important piece to this whole power assisted steering system is the front cylinder, which is located below the axle. So this cylinder is just under the axle. It is mounted onto the axle in the middle of the axle down there. Then the cylinder rod protrudes out and the hookup point is on the left spindle at this point right here. So most of you guys will probably understand that in most vehicles you have a power steering 
this right here happens to be a gearbox over the assisted steering system. Uh, that's why it is also called a power assisted steering system. Um, I believe this was uh, invented or even bought up by GM in the 50s. So GM technically owned the rights to this system right here. Um, it then evolved and became power steering. Uh, what we have nowadays in our vehicles, uh, probably many manufacturers own the rights to uh, manufacture those power steerings. But this right here is power assisted steering. So what that means is we have our gearbox, just like anything else, this is a mechanical system. From our steering wheel down to our gearbox, everything is mechanical. The linkage from the gearbox out and into the main valve is all mechanical. So. When I turn the steering wheel to the right, it is all mechanical. And I'll give you guys a close up view on how that looks like right here. Even though this steering system is 100% mechanical, we have a valve, which is the main valve, directly on our drag link, and that will assist your steering. So I'll give you guys a closer view on the drag link. The drag link starts at this point and goes all the way down to our linkage for our spindle. So this right here is the drag link, and in between our drag link, or on the drag link, in line, we have a control valve. Uh, the fluid will come in from our hydraulic block, which is right in between the frame rails. So that main valve block will supply fluid through this main hose into the control block. Then, in the control block, it will go out, which is the neutral position, through this fitting, and this fitting will then get hooked up to our oil cooler, which I do not have mounted. It will mount on the instrumental panel, and since I do not have that installed, I cannot mount the oil cooler and also the fitting, which will go right here. But the fluid comes into this valve block, and since we have it in our neutral position, the steering does not activate whatsoever. But now, if I grab the steering wheel, and we focus on the back end of this control valve, we will see when I turn to the left, the valve will push inwards like that. So I'll come back to neutral and turn to the left and it pushes inwards. So now what we have right here, in this valve block, we have a spring and we have two chambers. So we have a left chamber and a right chamber, which lead into these two hoses, which are smaller. And these two hoses lead up and down under to our front axle. Down under the front axle, we have our steering cylinder. That steering cylinder has two lines, and those two lines are these two right here. The control valve allows fluid to be diverted through one of these lines, and that will activate the steering cylinder on the front. If we then turn to our right, the valve will be pushed out. So this is turning to the right, as you guys can see, and I'll let go of the steering wheel and it goes back into the neutral position. That's what it should do. So I'll turn back to the right. That is opening up and diverting fluid the other way. So that will most likely divert fluid into this hose right here. And once these two hoses or one of these two hoses are pressurized, that will then allow fluid to be diverted into our steering cylinder on the front. The steering cylinder in the front will either push the rod out or retract the rod back into the cylinder and since it's hooked up to the left steering spindle, that will turn our wheel to the right or to the left. The setup of this power assisted steering system is very simple. We have our main valve block, which provides pressurized fluid to the control valve block, which is on the drag link down below. And then you either choose left or right, which diverts fluid to the left hose or the right hose, and that will activate our front steering cylinder on the front axle. So it's very simple. This technology is actually very old, uh, almost ancient in a sense, but uh, it acts just like a power steering, but it is a power assisted steering system. If you guys learned something today about power assisted steering systems, please hit that like button down below. Consider subscribing if you haven't already, and don't forget to hit that bell notification. As of right now, I'll share with you guys the three point hitch mechanism on this John Deere 400. On the rear of the John Deere 400, I have the three-point hitch in place. The only thing I do not mount is the rear gearbox. That is technically only if you have a rear-mounted rototiller or some other implement which needs a power takeoff. So that is not mounted right now, but I will share with you guys the three-point hitch mechanism 
which will allow you guys to operate Cat0 implements. So what Cat0 actually means is any tractor up to 20 horsepower, which would have a three point hitch, uh, that will allow you to operate certain implements on the back of the tractor. Obviously you wouldn't wanna go up to Cat1 because those implements are just heavier and built much stronger. Uh, they aren't built for up to 20 horsepower. So Cat implements are for up to 20 horsepower tractors. I shared a little bit of information on the John Deere 400 three-point hitch in my first video when I purchased this John Deere 400, but everything was dirty and it wasn't painted up. So I think now it will give you guys a better understanding and a better view on how everything looks like. The first thing I'll talk about are all the components involved within the three-point hitch, and then I'll move on how it actually works and I'll push air through the system instead of pressurized oil. So you guys will have a full understanding on how this lifts up and lowers as well. So I'll start from the bottom and work my way up. On the very bottom of the screen, you guys will see two arms that are identical and they are mirrored. So we have one on the left and one on the right. The hookup points are on the rear differential and we have other hookup points for our implements on the back. We have two hookup points right here, which will be held in place by pins. And the other two hookup points are on the garden tractor and they are also held in place with pins. These two arms are called lift arms as they lift up and they lower. So these two arms are called lift arms. In between our lift arms, we have these two chains which are hooked up to our lift arms on the inside. This will allow us to have a certain distance. So you do not want these chains unhooked or else it is possible that this lift arm will just come out to the side and possibly hit something as you're driving the garden tractor. So you want these safety chains in here to be placed within your lift arm and that will give you a certain distance where these lift arms can actually move in and out. So these safety chains are very important, especially if you have certain implements and you don't want the implement to always rock from left to right, you can adjust that right here on these safety chains. They have a yoke and a threaded rod. So it's possible to adjust the safety chain length. On the left and on the right side, we have these big bolts. What that allows us to do is level our right and our left lift arm. Let's say you have a blade in the back end, which is hooked up to a three point hitch and the blade isn't perfectly straight anymore. It is possible to come over here and turn this bolt and the right side or the right lift arm will then be raised. And in this case, you can level whichever implement you have hooked up to your three point hitch. This is a very nice feature and it's actually quite impressive that a tractor like this has such an amazing three point hitch system. These bolts are then mounted to our rock shaft and the rock shaft is what actually activates our lift arms to raise and lower. So when we look at the top end of the three point hitch, these points are hooked up to a rocking shaft and the rock shaft is then mounted between the frame rail and that's where our pivoting point is. So when I lift the lift arms up, the pivoting point of the rock shaft is right here in between the frame rails. The rock shaft is at the same time hooked up to our lift cylinder and that's eventually what will lift our implement in the back. So as I lift this up, the cylinder will be pushed out and as I lower it back down, the cylinder will retract again. I will share with you guys later on how this actually works. I will push air through the cylinder so you guys will see this raise and lower by itself. So I spoke a lot about the lift arms and those are two points of our three point system. Now we have one more hookup point and that is on the top of this base frame. The hookup point is through this top link. That is what this whole assembly right here is called. This is a top link. It is held in place to a fixed point on the frame. So we have this shaft, which is between our frame rails, and this is where our top link is held in place. Now the top link is also very special because we can turn this top link like so, and it will allow us to extend or retract the top link. And eventually the implement, which is hooked up to our three point hitch, will have the possibility to adjust and or pivot. So what that means is if you have a rototiller in the back and you adjust the top link to extend, your rototiller might dig into the ground more. And or if you have a blade, you would actually tilt the blade a little bit off to the side. And if you bring the top link back in, your blade will be a little bit more straight. 
So the top link has the possibility to adjust your implement in the back the way you like it. And this is a very crucial part of the three point hitch. The top link is just a stabilizer basically for this three point hitch assembly. But at the same time, you can adjust your implement. I'm on the right side of the garden tractor. I have my air hose hooked up to a pointy nozzle. This way I can force air through both hoses, which lead to the lift cylinder on the three point hitch. If I force air through one hose, it should lift the three point hitch. And then if I force air through the other hose, it should lower the three point hitch. So I'll share with you guys this right now, and it'll give you guys a better understanding of how this three point hitch actually works. I shared with you guys the base frame assembly with the tires finally on it. The John Deere 400 is back on the ground and now I can work on some other things. I shared with you guys valuable information on the power assisted steering which is on the front of the garden tractor and on the rear of the garden tractor I gave you guys a good insight on the three point hitch, shared with you guys every component of the three point hitch and also shared with you guys how it lifts and lowers with that rear lift cylinder. Now I'll bring you guys to the white table, share with you guys what I will work on in an upcoming video and hopefully I can get the engine running within this frame. Walking up to the white table, I have the instrumental panel in front of me. Everything has been stripped from the instrumental panel, even the serial number tag. So I took that off that I can sand this down to bare metal, give it a coat of primer and paint and that it looks like new again. I did run into a little issue on the instrumental panel. This is only for the John Deere 400 or even possibly the 400 series garden tractors. They have this little bushing off to the right. You have this little lever, which then sticks out onto the right. This will be your PTO activation lever. So if you want to activate your PTO, you will pull it back. That will be activated. If you leave it forward, that will deactivate your front PTO. The issue I had on this lever as you guys can see, the bushing is wore and the shaft as well. So now I have to go ahead and fix this up because I do not want the shaft to have this much play. Uh, obviously, if I have the yellow handle right there, which has been painted on the top, you will really notice how much this really shifts to the side. So we have about half an inch of play right here. So that's exactly how worn it is down below. I will probably weld up this shaft and make sure it fits within the bushing properly. So that is a little project I will be working on. After that's done, it will have to be welded to the bracket which mounts on the inside. But then before I even mount that on, the instrumental panel has to be tidy and it has to be painted up. A lot of the other parts are in this little bag, but I will share with you guys all this in an upcoming video. On to the right of the instrumental panel, we have the John Deere 400 dash. Uh, this right here is the grip for this lever. I painted this yellow and it's still gonna have to have a couple coats of clear coat, but that's gonna really look amazing once it's done. And it basically looks like new. So I'm really satisfied with that paint job. Moving on to the dash, I customized another dash on the John Deere 400 series. I took an oil-based marker. I outlined all the perimeters of each symbol and each little cutout. Everything is yellow. And then I gave the whole panel a couple clear coats of matte clear coat. So it's not glossy, it's really matte. Uh, once I put the gauges in here, you will not see some of the drips that I have towards the inside. But on the outside of any of the symbols, I do not have any drips. So I was very cautious of that. But everything here looks very cool and I'm really happy with how that turned out once again. So I'll get some work done on the instrumental panel and besides some of the paintwork, I also got the Kohler K532 ready to get mounted into the John Deere 400 main frame. I did do a rebuild video on this Kohler. The carburetor is not mounted right now because I went through the carburetor once more just to double check it and everything seems just fine so I can mount that right now. And then I will be placing this into the John Deere 400 mainframe. 
Once the engine is within the mainframe, I'll make sure it's bolted down and I get everything ready for the running time. The running time on the coolers that I like to do are about an hour long. So I get an external fuel tank, I run the engine for about a good hour, I get everything tuned up. The drive shaft is not in place because I still need that time for the engine to reach a certain temperature. And I also need that running time to tune the engine. Once that's done and I'm super satisfied with how the engine runs, I will then put the drive shaft on between the engine and the rear differential. I still have to add a whole bunch of fluid to the rear end of this garden tractor. So there are still a couple more things to do on the rear end, but I will focus on an upcoming video on the engine and the instrumental panel so I can really get that running time done. If you guys enjoyed this video, smash that like button down below. Consider subscribing if you haven't already and stay tuned for upcoming videos because I might just reveal a brand new project very soon.